All right. Well, welcome back. Hope you all had a nice lunch. Um, I'm Tate Paulette. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Joukowsky Institute, and I'm very happy to be moderating this afternoon's first session, which will consist of two papers, followed by time for questions, and then a coffee break. Uh, for this session, we'll be considering the rock-cut monuments of Mesopotamia and ancient Iran, with a particular focus on issues of memory, the sacred, the divine, presence, and absence. Um, our first speaker will be Matthew Canepa, professor in the Department of Art History at the University of Minnesota. His research focuses on the intersection of art, ritual, and power uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, Persia, and the wider Iranian world. Uh, he's also interested in cross-cultural interaction, a topic explored in his book, The Two Eyes of the Earth, Art and Ritual of Kingship Between Rome and Sasanian Iran, and in his edited volume, Theorizing Cross-Cultural Interaction Among the Ancient and Early Medieval Mediterranean, Near East, and Asia. Uh, and he's currently working on a book titled The Iranian Expanse, Architecture, Urbanism, Landscape, and Cosmology in Iranian Western Asia, 550 BCE to 642 CE. Today, though, he'll be discussing rock reliefs, memory, and the sacred in ancient Iran. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Kanepa. So th thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Felipe, for including me in this, and it's been wonderful to meet um, colleagues who I've known through their work for some time and uh, put a name to a face. All right, so my goal for this lecture is to explore how rock reliefs and inscriptions uh, formed and transformed Iranian identity, cosmologies, and perceptions of the past. So monumental rock reliefs and inscriptions, uh, either carved into the living rock or on ruins, played an especially important role as royal technologies of power and memory in ancient Iran. And this paper and the larger body of work from which it draws uh, focuses on what I characterize as the environmental, spatial, and visual bases of Iranian identity and royal power. That is landscape, architecture, the built environment, and the ritual activities that they hosted. These, I argue, played a complementary um, and central role in establishing and changing Iranian royal identity. And this is just as important as uh, textual or oral discourse. I argue that royal engagement with natural, urban, and arch architectonic space was not merely a reflection or trapping of imperial power, but a fundamental tool by which sovereigns created and transformed royal identity and continually instantiated it with ritual practice. So here we're focusing on Persia and the ancient Iranian world. Um, I approach Iran and Iranian as both geographically implanted and uh, politically defined, um, as well as a more fluid and malleable religious and cosmological concept. The interaction between historical and imaginary lands and empires uh, plays an important role in a lot of what we're going to be looking at. So along with reliefs and coins, inscriptions are one of the few unquestionably authentic primary sources in pre-Islamic Iranian historiography. While the field has depended on them to provide the most reliable data for studies of Iranian cultural uh, and political as well as art history, the focus of the majority of scholarship on inscriptions or reliefs themselves has centered on their internal content, decipherment and dating in the past. Thankfully, this has changed recently and I'm pleased to have played at least some role in this reorientation. The internal contents of inscriptions and reliefs were certainly important. However, the fact that, uh, that rock reliefs and inscriptions functioned for the majority of individuals who saw them as visual and spatial features of the natural or built environment alludes to a more complex set of, set of interactions among their contents and contexts. Rock reliefs accumulated at sites that shaped Iranian experiences of divine power in the past. I argue that they could translate ephemeral ritual performance or even a brief movement through a site into a permanent presence. And they could compel a relationship of continuity among vastly disparate monuments or historical actors. Uh, reliefs and inscriptions could also tangibly collapse gulfs of time that might separate two patrons. And this is most vividly illustrated by Shapur I's relief under the Achaemenid tombs at Nakshi Rustam, which you see here, and his great trilingual inscription, uh, which was carved on the tower of the Kabiye Zardusht, built by Darius I over 500 years before. 
This points to the most important and enduring, one of the most enduring functions of reliefs and inscriptions in Iran. Rather than a product of Iranian tradition, uh, these reliefs and inscriptions, by their very presence, were integral in generating and replicating practices that formed and maintained Iranian royal tradition. Now, certain strains of art and archaeology often speak of object agency. While I believe that humans must be considered the ultimate agents, and it's obfuscatory to you know, impute agency to objects as such, um, built and natural environments did indeed wield a special power to shape individual and collective cognition and identity. So I'd like to speak more directly about my methodological and, and theoretical underpinnings here. Um, my approach, which I develop more fully in my forthcoming book, proceeds from the conviction that both individual cognition and collective identities are highly implicated in the natural and built environment. Moreover, the personal and collective memories that constitute those identities often crystallize at specific sites, uh, natural or man-made. They shape and were shaped by the built and natural environment. Thus, it, should be, it shouldn't be surprising that a change in one could be understood to yield a change in the others. And here I found debates in cognitive science useful to articulate these concepts. A wide variety of external resources can what you call scaffold human cognition, including that relating to personal or uh, collective memories. Um, and of course, scaffolding means to support and facilitate. And in theories of an extended mind, when parts of the environment are coupled with the brain in the right way, they become part of the mind. Though in much of what we see here, um, the inverse of the statement is uh, equally true, I argue. When parts of our mind related to both cognitive and somatic processes are coupled with the environment in the right way, they become, in effect, part of the environment. Our memories are part of the environment. So as observed by, by Malafouris, if there's such a thing as human agency, there is material agency. And there's no way that human and material agency become, can become disentangled. I argue that this entanglement of mind, identity, and material not only concerns objects and technologies, but larger environmental and architectural spaces. <coughs> These different spaces afforded different possibilities of thought experience and activity. Most importantly, they also constrained others. The relationship between mind and matter occupies uh, not only contemporary theoretical approaches, but was deeply implicated also in ancient Iranian understandings of existence. Uh, according to Iranian religious theorizing, everything in this living material world also participates in the world of thought. That is the conceptual, spiritual dimension of existence. I'm not arguing that contemporary theoretical approaches map onto Iranian concepts. Yet the importance of the relationship between the conceptual world and the living material world is present in a number of Iranian religions. And we must take seriously these hylonoetic continua between place, space, and human minds and bodies in the ancient evidence as well. So from this point of view, Iranian approaches to cultivation of the earth, punishment of enemies, creation of perfected architectonic spaces, and perhaps carving of reliefs had deeper significances that had effects on both the living world and the world of thought, the permanent world. Um, through them, Iranian sovereigns shaped human subjectivities and behavior day to day, and believed they had a potential to bring into alignment and restore primordial perfection in this world, bringing this world uh, into alignment with the spiritual world. This was at the forefront of the minds of patrons and designers of the great Iranian palaces, as well as in a larger environmental sense uh, with Iranian rock reliefs. So we turn to the role of the built and natural environment in building a new vision of the past. As a permanent manifestation of a dynast identity and status in this world and the next, uh, tombs and dynastic cults and reliefs were key focal points of royal efforts to shape time and memory. Rock-hewn tombs and inscriptions, as well as reliefs and earthworks, affected a permanent fusion between a king and the landscape, 
making him a permanent environmental presence and continually reinforcing the experience that even a newly established dynasty was part of the natural order of things. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, Darius I of the Achaemenid dynasty was the first king of the Persian Empire to carve monumental rock reliefs as well as inscriptions. He sponsored the invention of the old Persian cuneiform syllabary and produced the greatest volume of reliefs and inscriptions in the Achaemenid era. And the repertoire of rupestrian and epigraphic practices that he established, his successors cultivated and followed with little de deviation. So Achaemenid inscriptions appear mainly in two contexts, as monumental reliefs carved into the living rock. Um, and this is often in close proximity to figural relief sculpture. Um, and we see this illustrated here with uh, the uh, inscription that sort of pours over the, the surface of the relief. Um, as Beata mentioned last night, these inscriptions were, were trilingual, with Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian, and Akkadian uh, versions arranged in parallel columns or panels. Um, in a way, reliefs on palaces and rock faces were coextensive and mutually constituting. And just as important, the inscriptions themselves uh, functioned just as importantly as, as sort of a, a, graphic, uh, a graphic effect as something textual, uh, and most of the time these were, were hardly legible. Um, <coughs> in some instances, in fact, inscriptions themselves are the only visual features. The site of Ganjnama, located in Media, 12 kilometers from Ekmatana, hosted two small rectangular inscriptions carved into the rock near a waterfall on a route through the Alvan Mountains. Uh, similarly, the only rock inscription the dynasty carved outside of Iran consisted of a panel on the towering cliffs of the citadel of Van in present-day Turkey, ancient Tushpa. Darius uh, started the inscription, carving away the frame, and his son Xerxes finished it, adding the inscription itself. And Xerxes simply states in the inscription that he brought it to his completion, what his father had begun. So, so just simply a a reference to uh, continuity in and of itself. This gets to the heart of the ultimate impact and purpose of many Achaemenid monumental rock cut inscriptions, as well as their malleability thereafter. They laid claim to the empire's landscape and recoded it, reoriented it to serve, to serve the empire. The majority of rock cut inscriptions, with the possible exception of Ganjname would have been illegible because of their location, high up on cliff faces. Their contents, however, were no doubt known and likely circulated in other monumental media. Uh, to judge from evidence from the multiple copies of Darius's Bissitude inscription, which Beata introduced and explored last night, Darius's great Bissitude relief portrays the king in divine conversation with the great god Ora Mazda, lording over pretenders and rebels who we learned from the inscription, were infected with the demonic lie whom Darius cleansed from this earth by torturing and executing them. The image and text successfully transformed the alternate, uh, alternate facts of Darius's propaganda machine into divinely sanctioned truth with a capital T. As Beata mentioned last night, papyri fragments of his inscription emerged in Elephantine, Egypt, and to corroborate his claim that their contents were circulated widely um, in numerous different languages and possibly read out in public settings. Uh, indeed, the king himself mentions that the old Persian inscription at Bissetun was inscribed and read out to him in its entirety, a public performance that likely occurred for the inscription on his tomb at Nakshi Rostam as well. This ritualized act linked the visual impact of row upon row of inscriptions spreading across the rock face with their intended meaning and with the royal presence. Nevertheless, their indelible visual presence was continually indexed to the royal presence, if not the entire content of the inscriptions, marking both the landscape and the viewer's mind. The problem, however, is that bereft of local interpretants in the know, um, invested in, in that intended meaning, that significance could be manipulated or lost. And this is the cognitive and cultural space that we at this symposium are dealing with. Um, and this is exactly what the Seleucids took advantage of, in my opinion. Along with many other monuments in Babylonia or northern Iran, 
that the Achaemenids had created or modified, such as Babylon's walls, Bissetun was at some point success successfully separated from the dynasty. While they did not attempt to rival or supersede Darius's relief, the Seleucids and their agents very likely succeeded in disassociating the prestige of the site from the Achaemenids and reorienting it to the Seleucid dynasty. Um, in ancient accounts of the site, drawn from multiple sources, uh, Darius was forgotten as the relief's patron. Instead, Darius was understood to be Semiramis, the legendary Assyrian queen, and his vanquished enemies, uh, her soldiers and suitors. Uh, because Diodorus mentions Ctesias at the beginning of uh, this section, this larger section, uh, this specific legend has often been ascribed to him. However, Diodorus also mentions he drew from other post-conquest historians for his overview. More tellingly, in my opinion, um, is that other Seleucid agents, like Barossus, uh, the Babylonian priest writing for Antiochus I, routinely use Semiramis to obscure Achaemenid patronage. And even if the stories of Semiramis began as local legend, this suggests that the Seleucids would have been happy to promote her patronage to diffuse power the power of such monuments. To those who viewed the relief through the filter of this legend, the robed figure, figure of Darius was thus not a great king, but rather a queen, and the other figures not captive kings, but the soldiers whom the legend recounts Semiramis laid with while whiling away the hours in the site's paradise. Darius has thus been unmanned and reconstructed discursively into a wanton woman. So even though it doesn't engage the Achaemenid relief, uh, the only uh, rock relief from the Seleucid period uh, that survives at least, um, nonetheless engages the medium. In order to claim the site, the Seleucids or their agents were compelled to, uh, to carve a relief below Darius's relief on the level of the plain, as well as uh, include a bilingual Greek and Aramaic inscription uh, up here in this uh, cut stele. Um, just as the Semir Seleucid Semiramis narrative effaced Darius from the site, the, the Heracles relief reorients and claims the site's sacral significance. This was located quite possibly at the entranceway to the Hellenistic uh, sanctuary. The later Parthian relief of Mithridates II is on the level of the plain as well, which responds to the entrance of the sanctuary and uh, stems from the placement of the Heracles relief. However, however here we see, and here's a, a line drawing from the uh, early modern period. Uh, now it's been obscured by a, a Safavid inscription. Um, its composition still responds, responds to the Achaemenid relief, uh, a compositional engagement, though not a spatial engagement. And this hints at the fact that the Achaemenid relief still, or perhaps again, held power in the uh, Parthian period. So reliefs and their reinscription play a pivotal role in the rise of the Sasanian, uh, Sasanian dynasty. The dynasty has at its roots in the province of Pars in southwestern Iran, the homeland of the Achaemenid Empire. And although their empire had been defunct for centuries, the ruined palaces, sacred sites, and tombs of the, of the Achaemenid kings of kings still loomed large on the physical and ideological horizons of the province. The early Sasanians expended incredible resources to connect with these remnants of this half-understood past. And this is something that I've, I've studied in, in a number of studies. This region under the Seleucids had become a backwater, ruled by local dynasties who adhered to local traditions, but remained uh, faithful by and large uh, to the Seleucid sovereigns um, until they could uh, finally rule semi-independently. The Achaemenid remains exercised the imagination of these local rulers. And like them, the pre-imperial Sasanians felt compelled to connect with them, rebuilding portions of Persepolis and even carving detailed etchings into the stone sills of the harem of Xerxes. And while very small, these you know, oftentimes are referred to as, as graffiti, but they're quite a bit more elaborate than just that. Um, these, these etchings uh, establish important ideological and artistic precedents that their later reliefs would carry out on a much grander scale. In fact, it appears that the Sasanians took advantage of a deep-seated provincial sense of longing for a lost glorious past, uh, though exactly who this represented and who uh, 
created these vestiges was uh, lost. The Sasanians nonetheless offered a coherent narrative and, just as importantly, a spatial experience that healed over these losses in memory. So to create a tangible and powerful experience of their dynasty's new vision of Iranian history um, and the Sasanian dynasty's place in it, the founders of the dynasty reconstituted and reanimated the awe-inspiring yet half-understood ruins of Pars. They wove together the old Achaemenid and new Sasanian sites. Um, and they did this facilitated uh, with ritual and uh, the visual image. At Nakshi Rustam and Persepolis, they created, at Nakshi Rustam, they created rock reliefs and founded fires that celebrated their memory. And the rich topography of memory that the first kings of the dynasty wrought yielded this powerful experience of this new vision of the past, where Sasanian foundations and Achaemenid remains uh, were spliced into a coherent whole. Just as importantly, their sites and techniques enabled their successors to continually reconnect with this heritage and create new politically useful uh, visions of the past themselves. So while the Sasanians stringently guarded their place as the heir of Iran's ancient traditions, these ancient traditions themselves, of course, were not stable. Uh, as soon as the dynasty uh, took power, the Sasanians turned to the Eastern Iranian conception of the past that the Arsacids had also cultivated. The Sasanians began to produce a genealogy as reflected in their official history that grafted their dynasty along with the Achaemenids onto that of one of the, the primordial dynasties of Iran, the Canids. By the late empire, the Sasanians had created an all-encompassing universal history, the Hwade Namag, the Book of Sovereigns. And this presented the dynasty as the heritors of an Iranian tradition of kingship that stretched back to the first king and first man. The dynasty foregrounded Eastern Iranian ideas such as the Hwara, which inhabited and thus linked them to every rightful area ruler since the first king of humanity. Um, this is the, the uh, luminous divine glory. It was represented as a dysnimbus in Sasanian iconography. Uh, Sasanian kings began incorporating candid titles, in particular in the fourth century, overtly calling themselves K uh, and taking candid names such as Hosra, um, starting in the, in the fourth and intensifying later on. We can track the intensification of this process, but even in the age of Ardashir, this new Canid identity was burgeoning. And this is important to keep in mind um, when we look at these engagements with the Achaemenid past. Um, what's remarkable about the Sasanian dynasty's additions to this site is not simply their monumentality, but the extent to which they sensitively, seamlessly, and unrelentingly incorporated the Achaemenid material into this larger vision. And this engagement went far beyond a simple interest in the Achaemenid's remains. Uh, parallels between the two dynasties' uh, discursive and ritual expressions are so startlingly close that it's much more likely that some sort of causative, if not lineal, relationship lay behind these pronounced similarities than to posit them that they happen simply by random. From the point of view of the Sasanian self-definition, the remains of the Achaemenid reliefs were not necessarily understood to be Achaemenid. Rather, uh, like the Palace of Persepolis, they were significant primarily because they were vestiges of the Canid heritage. They connected the, the Sasanians, um, not to just the historical kings, but the primordial Iranian past, the primordial kings, the Canid kings, stretching back to the beginning of time. So while not ascribed uh, through ignorance or malicious intent to a non-Iranian queen, the Achaemenids are nonetheless similarly elided and replaced, in this case with the, with the Canids. So Ardash Shir, the first king of the, of the empire uh, and the founder of the dynasty, was responsible for forging the first enduring link between the Achaemenid remains and the Sasanian dynasty. And this began the site's full trans transformation um, into a Sasanian site of memory. Ardashir's relief at Nakshi Rostam was the last relief he executed in Pars and combines the themes of his earlier rock reliefs, triumph and investiture, into a single harmonious image. More importantly, it was the first time that any king had dared permanently alter this sacred and ancient site. 
Ardashir's son, Shapur I, and his successors carved rock reliefs directly underneath the four Achaemenid tombs. In the, and you can see uh, here uh, Shapur's relief underneath uh, the tombs of Darius and the tomb attributed to Artaxerxes I. More subtly, aspects of the Sasanian reliefs show careful study of the Achaemenid sculptural style, and in, a, in effect, a sort of a reinvigoration of this. Um, and also motifs, as for example, uh, com compositions uh, as well, such as the, the treatment of horses, um, and even the, sort of the, the posture of the horse's head. Though again, when we see this sort of, of sculptural style, we should think not necessarily Achaemenid style, but rather Canid style. Um, we also see this in, in things like the drapery folds in the king's robe and those on the god Ormazd on Ardashir's relief. And even the treatment of hands or in the beard of the god Ormazd, which evokes that of the great king. In effect, reaching um, into this sort of cagnet past to create a uh, timeless and primordial image of the, of the great god. This was not isolated to the area um, just to Nakshirustam, um, nor to the area around Persepolis. For example, we see this also in ornamental material too, and I think this per, uh, shows an, and creates a, an important parallel. The stucco cavetto cornices at Ardakshir's palace at Firuzabad, uh, which you see here, evoke the Achaemenid cavetto cornices at the palace of Persepolis. And in, in effect, they cloak the incredibly innovative uh, architectural forms of Sasanian domed vaulted architecture in this ancient uh, ornamental uh, material. And Shapur's deliberate recreation of the Kemenid, or perhaps we should say Canid, adore bull capitals uh, also appear in, in, this, in the temple of his new city at Bishapur. Um, so Nakshi Rustam at itself uh, performed a, a special function within the early Sasanian dynasty. Um, and of course, this wasn't the first time that the site had been changed and manipulated. Darius claimed the site, uh, converting what had been an Elamite water sanctuary into the Achaemenid necropolis. And in do doing so, he reoriented its numinous significance for the dynasty. In addition to carving a monumental tomb uh, with a palatial facade, an image of the king, uh, he constructed a monumental tower at the site as well. Darius originally constructed the Kabi or Dush, as it's called, in careful imitation of a tower built by Cyrus the Great at Pesargade, known as the Zaindani Suleiman. Although theories abound, the original Achaemenid function of the Kaaba is unknown, uh, at least definitively, providing clues, however, to a deeper engagement with Achaemenid royal cultural practices. Shapur carved a trilingual Persian, Parthian, and Greek inscription into the lower levels of three sides of the Achaemenid structure. And here you see uh, the location of the structure of the tower and the location of the Sasanian inscriptions on it. The first portion of Shapur's inscription proclaims his royal genealogy and the extent of the empire. And similar in strategy to the monumental rock reliefs, the presence, the mere presence of Shapur's inscription claims the structure for the king of kings and for the dynasty. The content, however, goes quite a bit further and echoes the general order and even phraseology of the Achaemenid's old Persian inscriptions. The final two fifths of Shapur's Kaaba inscription describes a complex ritual protocol for the benefit of the soul and memory of Shapur himself, as well as uh, his queen of queens, three of his sons, and this is done for the benefit of, of their souls in the afterlife. And a structure, in many ways, um, is very similar to ritual protocols uh, that had been recovered in the Persepolis Fortification Archive, uh, as well as echoed in, in Greek sources for a Achaemenid uh, funerary cult. So as the parallels between the Middle and Old Persian inscriptions here illustrate, the content of this late antique inscription attests to these stunning continuities. However, by late antiquity, the old Persian script and language had long fallen out of use, and Shapur and his subjects could not read 
or compare the contents of the late antique inscriptions with ancient precursors. So what made Shapur's statement significant was the fact that it was carved into the ancient uh, Akemnid or perhaps Canid structure. And in a sense, um, what's quite possible, what we're looking at here, is something that is sort of recovered and uh, reconstructed out of epic oral discourse and then regrounded at the site itself. So these precedents were followed by uh, the next generations of kings. Uh, for example, this double joust scene tentatively attributed to Vahram II lines up directly under the Achaemenid tomb, extending the long vertical arm of this cruciform shape. And Bahram II also incorporated <laughs> remains of one of the site's old Elamite reliefs into a scene uh, depicting his family and courtiers playing triumph, uh, paying homage. So although it differed stylistically from the Achaemenid reliefs, it's possible that Vahram valued this ancient relief as a remnant of his ancient Canid ancestors. Uh, incorporating it seamlessly into the composition. Rock reliefs continue to play an important role in this process of rewriting the past, or rather petrifying a new ideologically correct alternative reality. In order to convert what, what was, in effect, a brazen usurpation and subversion of his father's wishes into an epic battle between good and evil, the King of Kings Narsi adapted uh, and redeployed the memorial techniques and monumental forms that his grandfather and father had created at Nakshi Rostam. Narsi's monumental and discursive portrayal of his usurpation is paralleled in his reworking of Vahram I's rock relief at Bishapur. Uh, Vahram I was the fourth Sasanian king, and he was the eldest brother of Shapur and succeeded his brother Hormizd, who had reigned for only a year. Narsi uh, bided his time as Vahram's sons and grandsons all also uh, irritatingly named Vahram, uh, <laughs> succeeded to the throne uh, until he took advantage of the accession of the weak boy king, Vahram III, and he overthrew, whom he overthrew to seize power. Uh, according to Narsi's later inscription on this relief, uh, to, to a, a later inscription um, at a, a different site, Ahraman and all the demons moved a certain Vahnam, son of Tatrus, to attached the diadem to the head of Vahram through sorcery. The empire was thrown into disorder, and the Persian, um, only later did the Persian and Parthian noble families finally break free of the grip of this dark sorcery and beseech Narsi to take the throne and acclaim him um, as the Sasanian's most, uh, as the king most righteous and worthy of worship and kingship. Narsi claimed this relief for himself, adding an inscription identifying the king to be him and modifying the composition. And in doing so, it refocused the relief's message to serve in his wider propaganda campaign. The relief was a rendition of Ardashir's symmetrical mounted investiture, uh, though without the fallen enemies below. Narsi added a fallen defeated enemy under the hooves, quite possibly intended to be Vahnam, son of Tatrus. The inclusion of the enemy compositionally imputes a demonic, achramonic nature to the defeated and reinforces the king's own righteousness and role of um, sort of God-given agent of order. Uh, it adapts the monumental idioms that his grandfather and father established to portray the event, this uh, the events of his reign as divinely ordained, and reshaping, reshaped the official version of events, uh, just as he had reshaped the relief itself. So the last thing I, I want to look at um, performs a sort of monumental analog. Um, so, analogously writing, rewriting the past, Narsi's late 3rd century monument at Paikuli reflects the later prestige of Shapur's refashioned tower, the copies are douched. According to the inscription um, carved onto the, onto the sides of the facade of the tower, Narsi created the structure at the very site where he was met and acclaimed uh, king of kings by representatives of the leading dignitaries and families of the empire. Um, so Shapur's refashioning of the Kaaba very likely inspired the idea that a tower bearing royal inscriptions uh, and reliefs, somewhat sort of abbreviated here with these relief blocks, was a fitting royal monument and a vehicle of royal 
uh, discursive truth. Narsi's goal was to legitimize that uh, and commemorate his accession. Uh, but the route that this was located was the one which the Iranian armies of the highlands uh, made their yearly progress through westwards tr to campaign against the Romans. Their predecessors' supported, uh, purported support for Narses would be called to mind and in a sense reenacted and reaffirmed as they pro progressed along the route to the campaigns. So to conclude, rock reliefs and inscriptions were both technologies of power and memory. They were among those interrelated techniques that converted undifferentiated places into politically and socially potent spaces. And along with them, they changed uh, in concert. Uh, reliefs and inscriptions could knit the features of natural and architectonic space into a larger semantically and politically powerful whole. And as individuals identify with an environment, so their identity comes to be constructed through that environment. So taking into account this wider network, uh, such changes could therefore reshape the cultural understanding of the natural and built environments and individuals' understanding of themselves in relation to it. When either was damaged or disrupted or destroyed, it had to be reconstructed or reinvented, but not without reciprocal changes to the other. To access this, um, it is vital when seeking to understand the later significances of rock art inscriptions that we extend our focus beyond the discursive descriptions of the sites and the frames of the reliefs themselves. Right. Thank you. Okay, um, I said we were gonna do questions after the second paper, but I think we're gonna actually change it up and do the questions now. So, are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you for this very, very interesting talk. I have two comments. The first one is, let's say, dealing with Iran in a linguistic and national manner. I think this could be difficult because there is an interesting prologue to your, to your talk, and you already hinted at it when you're referring to the Ilamite relief in Bisutun, that there is something before the Achaemenids and that the Achaemenids themselves are incorporating this kind of remote past into their conception and dialogue with the past. And of course, the famous relief of Bihistun is somehow quoting the relief of Anubanini in Sarepole Sohak, which is some 200 kilometers to the north. So there is already something there and this kind of dialogue and communication existed already in Achaemeni times uh, with, with uh, the earlier past. And the second comment I would like to make is that dissociating the Semarami story from, from Ctesias, I think it is, it is not without problems because as you know very well, uh, the Queen Semarami is really a, a hero in the, in the fragments of Ctesias. So it is very well based on, on, on I would say, on good, um, uh, uh, source material we, uh, which we have that Semiramis in this conception is something which is related to Ctesias and I think it nevertheless fits very well um, in, in your sense that this kind of mocking uh, with uh, Darius uh, and uh, saying no it's, it's a female who, who have done uh, uh, this and that already works let's say uh, in the 4th century uh, BCE and we do not have to move this to Seleucid times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, hence my, I'll kind of work backwards, but hence my sort of fudging <laughs> was saying that, you know, it, it's quite possible, but you know, not necessarily. Yeah. But it, it would definitely be a, um, I guess what I, what I would sort of stick with is that this is a, a story that would be useful and perhaps, you know, uh, an alternate history to, to promote, uh, perhaps. And uh, it's also, it's interesting that it kind of, uh, she pops up in these other strategic and inconvenient achievements of the of the Achaemenids, such as Cyrus rebuilding the walls of Babylon, yeah, yeah, yeah. and she's of course doing that. Um, I, I'm I'm glad that you that you kind of brought us back to the Elamite tradition. I think that that um, comparison is is an important. And I think also the contrast that it brings out. Um, I, I see a, 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 there there definitely is a precedent, but I see the relationship between the Achaemenids and the Elamite material and speaking here the Achaemenids of Darius and afterwards as slightly different. I mean, in, in a sense, Darius obliterates the original significance of the Elamite water sanctuary. He appropriates it and takes it versus 
very subtly and uh, sensibly trying to kind of fit in and, and reinvigorate. Um, but I, I, I think that this is definitely a, um, a characteristic of, of the reign of Darius and on, where you have this, this shift in royal ideology and the creation of Persian identity and Persian um, Iran Iranianness in a sense. Um, but I, I, that, um, I think that's kind of, it brings out sort of an, an important um, issue that we're dealing with here is that it's, that it's not all the same. It's just, you know, continuity isn't, doesn't always have to mean continuity. Matthew, how much do we know about investiture ritual of the Sasanians? Because what is intriguing to me when I, you know, coming from the Assyrian background, mm -hmm. <coughs> ancestors play a big role in the state ritual of the Assyrian king. Um, we <coughs> instating him <coughs> annually in, in his power. And um, the way the investiture scene is carved right in, you know, uh, below the, uh, the tombs here, to me, is very telling. As if the mm. former dynasty of the Achaemenids, in fact, is legitimizing the rule of the, of the Sasanian dynasty, but not only um, perhaps, you know, in architecture, but is it some kind of uh, architectural <coughs> reinforcement of a ritual where uh, this would also play a role, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, this is, again, one of those uh, ta uh, tantalizing parallels with the Achaemenid period. And one of the, 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 I guess, more plausible hypotheses of what the function of the, those towers were was uh, something to do with, with the royal initiation. Um, and this is either something that uh, held you know, certain regalia or, or you know, that involved in the initiation. But um, there's this, this close c connection with legitimacy and you know, this sort of sanctuary. Uh, Darius seems to have wanted to Im import, b replicate basically what was going on at Pasargadae and try to kind of shift the focus here. Um, the, the other sort of interesting observation that, that your, your comment uh, brought to mind was that um, in later Iranian thought the the Huara of the king, the royal divine fortune of the kings, uh, still uh, inhabited the bones, their, their excarnated bones, which is why uh, you know, the, the Sasanians uh, destroyed the tombs and, and took the, the bones of the Arsacid kings of Armenia back to, to, um, to Iran. Um, so it's, we don't know if these, these tombs were reused, but you know this is one possibility. There's definitely um, this area is just covered in, in uh, funerary, mortuary preparation tables and ossuaries and that sort of thing. So I wouldn't be surprised if this was also had something to do with uh, the f kind of funerary preparations or kind of, you know, um, if not the tombs themselves, the Sasanians. Um, so that's, that's an interesting, I kind of need to think more about that, but that's a really interesting observation. Yeah. So first of all, thank you. This is uh, for me really <coughs> fascinating. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to ask about that Canaan or Canaan connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy if you can expand on that a bit because I, I just I didn't understand and I don't know anything about it. Did the Sassanite know about what did they know about their predecessors, about their Achaemenid? Did they know the names or the history or, or th didn't they even know the name of Achaemen, Achmen or maybe for them? It was just a lost ancestor that for us is just an eponymous legendary name. Yeah, this is, I mean, the, the reason why I kind of um, inserted this in here is because uh, for, for generations, a lot of the debate around, uh, around this problem was how well did the Sasanians know the Achaemenids? And was there, did, did they choose to recreate and rebuild the Achaemenid Empire as the Achaemenid Empire? And we, is, the answer is, is not necessarily either you know, completely yes or completely no. They they seem to have understood, you know, they knew that there was kings from an earlier dynasty, and they they only knew that dynasty though is basically as a couple of Darius's, <laughs> Darius son of Darius. Um, we have no uh, indigenous evidence that they knew the Achaemenids by that name. That dynasty just doesn't seem to have. That that's something that only exists in the in the Western tradition. Cyrus or, or anything of the, the great the memory that was so whatever was preserved in Greek 
about the Caymanids was not known to these. And, th and this is the other portion of it, because surely they had they 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 you know had access to this, and surely they knew it. But if you look at just their their uh, the poetic epic tradition, um, is really just a couple of Darius's, which are the the conduit back to the glorious Canaanite dynasty. Now, some of that is probably an accident of, of um, survival. And of course, you have Jewish communities within, um, within you know, Mesopotamia that they could have also have knowledge of, the, of this earlier king. And then, of course, Christian communities. And you have, uh, for example, the Nestorian bishops acclaiming uh, Khosrow II as a new Cyrus. Um, so in some ways, this is, I think this is dependent on, on which audience is being directed to. And I think this Canid ideology is to the Iranian <coughs> aristocracy. Um, Though I think there's definitely other uses and manipulations of the past, but you know that that's with these with the site, you know these rock reliefs. That was kind of in earlier traditions of scholarship that was just given as one yet another example that you know they were just trying to kind of they're, they're basically the 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 poor man's Achaemenids trying to recreate the empire or something like that. Um, but in any case, that's yeah, that's what it's about. Uh, a kind of practical question if you could uh, back to your. Um, your slide with Kanjnama mm -hmm. about these panels which are purely inscriptions. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if there are any ideas about these holes that are placed close to the inscriptions. Could there have been some kind of imagery attached or are they practical, some kind of construction that was being used for preparing the reliefs or are there any ideas? <laughs> Yeah, or or some sort of um, something to protect it from the elements. That, that's another hypothesis that's been put forward. Well, I, well, there's a, a platform up here, and I think that this was an, an area that hosted some sort of ritual activity of some sort, and kind of an open air platform. Yeah, um, so these very likely didn't exist just by themselves, but um, yeah, but all we really have at this point are just the holes, <laughs> and uh, no parallels really with with other examples. Yes. So one of the things that, I've, that Valeria and I have tried to do in, in our articles on our articles on, on Anatolian reliefs is to show the intensity of, say, elite, non-elite interaction with mm -hmm. these things and, and the fact that, they're, that even though most scholarship on this stuff has, has really focused on the elite production and reception of these things, it seems to us that, that actually there is a lot of, of cross-pollination. And so you said a little bit about oral epic perhaps informing part of the reception of the reliefs. I don't know whether the graffiti is also, if you can say anything about who did that. Yeah. But, but I guess the question is, can you get at, at sort of the non-elite reception of this stuff? No, <laughs> that's what's so <laughs> irritating. Yeah, okay. the, 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 these sites seem to be tightly controlled. Um, you know, the, the, everything we have here is elite. Um, when you get outside the site, then there's lots of little ossuaries, and there's some kind of later post-conquest, post-Islamic uh, ossuaries at the site. But still, I mean, we're we're not talking, um, you know, just a huge profusion of graffiti. Um, so, and, and we don't have the, the kind of the, the textual evidence that one has in the classical material that you can kind of get little anecdotes and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's you, you kind of have only the evidence from the site itself in a lot of ways. I think that could change if this could ever be excavated. Right, yeah, because I think yeah. that in the, on the Anatolian case, yeah. you, even the texts tend to highlight the elite yeah. version much more than the non-elite version, but the archaeology does give you a different picture because there's a lot of intervention, there's a lot of moving that stuff around or doing things around it. Yeah, the one test trench that Schmidt dug through it, um, it's, it's basically created uh, or uh, exposed uh, what appears to be an archive building connected with, uh, with what you'd expect to find at a fire temple. Um, of some sort, you know, of some sort. So you know, this was definitely packed with material, but in, in some that case, it's also sort of elite <laughs> right. type of yeah. Yeah. structures. But may I just add one point? Here? Mm. But what one can mention in this context mm. is the modern name of this site, Nakshi Rustam, you know, mm. Rokov Rust yeah. Rustam and Tahti Jamshid for Persepolis. Mm. This exactly hints at something you were talking about that in a popular consciousness th there was another level or how to say. I think this is also quite an interesting point in this respect. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. and Takti Jamshid as well, the yeah, name yeah. of, of yeah, Jamshid, yeah, yes, exactly. the primordial king. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Um, it's an, it, it sort of jogged my memory, uh, Vito Messina's excavations at uh, Hongi Azar, it, it's a uh, 
Elam, uh, sort of a Elamaic, Elamaeus relief sites. Uh, so it's, it's basically a site that had been returned to many different uh, generations from, you know, it was an Elamite water sanctuary probably, and then a kind of a, a Hellenistic, you know, Parthian era sanctuary, but there's sort of layers of arrowheads uh, that were excavated out there. So my, my sense is that there's yeah, that there, it's just don't have it yet. Yeah. I think we probably need to yeah, do sure. more. Thanks. I'm gonna do a computer switch here. Mm -hmm. I'll let you. <laughs>